The Life, a User's Manual, by Georges Perec, and this is from Chapter 38, The Tale of Four Young Folk Stuck in the Lift. The lift is out of order, as usual. It has never worked really well. On the night of the 14th to the 15th of July, 1925, barely a few weeks after it was installed, it got stuck for seven hours. There were four people in it, which allowed the insurance to refuse to pay for the repair, since it was designed for three people or 200 kilograms. The four victims were Madame Albin, then called Flora Champigny, Raymond Albin, her fiancé, then doing his military service, Monsieur Jérôme, who was then a young history teacher, and Serge Valen. They had gone to Montmartre to see the firework display and had walked back by way of Pigalle, Clichy, and Batignolles, stopping at most of the bars for a glass of dry white wine or a drop of well-chilled rosé. They were therefore rather more than merry when the event occurred around four in the morning, between the fourth and fifth floors. After the first moment of panic, they called the concierge. It wasn't yet Madame Claveau, but an old Spanish woman who'd been there ever since the early days of the building. She was called Madame Aranya, and really looked like her name as she was dry, dark, and hunched. She came dressed in an orange dressing gown with green branch motifs and a sort of cotton sock serving as a nightcap, ordered them to be quiet, and warned them not to expect to be rescued for several hours. Left alone in the gray light of dawn, the four young folk, for they were all young then, made a list of their assets. Flora Champigny had scraps of roast hazelnut in the bottom of her handbag, and they shared them, but regretted it immediately as it increased their thirst. Valen had a lighter, and Monsieur Jérôme had some cigarettes. They lit a few, but obviously they'd have preferred a drink. Raymond Albin suggested they pass the time with a game of Bellotte, and got a greasy pack of cards out of his pocket but saw straight away that the jack of clubs was missing. They decided to substitute for the lost jack a piece of card-sized paper on which they were going to draw a face both ways up, a club, a capital J, and even the jack's name. <clears throat> Baltard, said Valin. No, Augier, said Monsieur Jérôme. No, Lancelot, said Raymond Aubin. They argued in whispers for a while, then agreed they really didn't have to name the jack. Then they tried to find a piece of paper, Monsieur Jérôme proposed one of his visiting cards, but it wasn't the right size. The best they found was the back of an envelope that Valen had got the previous evening from Bartle Booth to tell him that, owing to Bastille Day, he would not be able to come tomorrow for his daily watercolor lesson. He had already told him that orally a few hours earlier at the end of his last session, but the letter no doubt demonstrated one of the characteristic traits of Bartle Booth's behavior, or perhaps simply provided an opportunity to use the letterhead uh, he had just printed out on a magnificent hazy vellum paper, almost bronze in color, with his monogram in modern style inscribed in a lozenge. Obviously, Valen had a pencil in his pocket, and when they had managed to use Flora Champigny's nail scissors to cut out a correct size piece of envelope more or less neatly, he dashed off a very presentable jack of clubs with a few strokes, which provoked his three uh, companions into whistles of admiration for the good likeness, Raymond Albin, for the speed of execution, Monsieur Jérôme, and for the intrinsic beauty of the drawing, Flora Champigny. But they then ran into another problem, because brilliant as it was, the substitute jack was too easy to distinguish from the other cards, which in itself was not reprehensible, except in Belote, where the jack does in fact play an important role. The only solution, Monsieur Jérôme then said, was to use an otherwise ordinary card, say the Seven of Clubs, as the Jack of Clubs, and to draw a Seven of Clubs on another piece of envelope. You should have said so in the first place, grumbled Valen, and in fact there wasn't enough envelope left. What's more, Flora Champigny, tired no doubt from waiting to be taught to play Belotte, had gone to sleep, and her fiancé had ended up following her example. Valen and Monsieur Jérôme thought for a while of playing two-handed, but neither was very keen, and they soon gave up the idea. Thirst and hunger, more than weariness, gnawed at them. They began to tell each other of the best meals they'd ever had, then to swap recipes, a domain in which Monsieur Jérôme turned out to be unbeatable. He hadn't quite finished listing the ingredients needed to make il pâté, according to a recipe going back, he said, to the Middle Ages, before it was Valen's turn to drop off. Monsieur Jérôme, who must have drunk more than any of the others and wanted to carry on having fun, tried for a few minutes to wake him. He couldn't. 
and to pass the time, he began to hum some of the hits of the day, then, getting into a stride, began to improvise freely on a tune in which his mind must have been the closing theme of L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, of which he had seen the Paris premiere a few weeks before at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. His merry vocation soon roused from their beds. Um, oh, sorry. His merry vociferation soon roused from their beds, then from their respective flats, the occupants of the fourth and fifth floors. Madame Hébert, Madame Urcade, Grandfather Echard, with his cheeks in lather, Gervais, Monsieur Colomb's housekeeper, in a Zinana cloth, cloth bed jacket. A Zinana cloth bed jacket. Lace bonnet and bobbled slippers. And finally, with his mustache bristling, Emile Gratiolet himself, the landlord who lived at the time on the fifth floor left in one of the two flats, Rorschach would knock into one thirty-five years later. Emile Gratiolet was not exactly an accommodating man. In other circumstances, he would certainly have evicted the four troublemakers on the spot. Was it the spirit of Bastille Day that moved him to clemency, or Raymond Albin Trooper's uniform, or the delicious flesh on Flora Champigny's cheeks? Whatever the cause, the upshot was that he pulled the lever, allowing the lift doors to be opened from the outside, helped the four merrymakers to clamor out of the narrow cage, and sent them to bed without even threatening to sue or find them. End of section 38.